Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the power of counteroffers. It's something that I cover in Chapter 4 of Game Theory 101 Bargaining, and you can check the video description for more information about that. Let's briefly talk about where we were versus where we're going. Previously, we've been looking at ultimatum games. In these ultimatum games, Albert has been making an offer to Barbara, which Barbara accepts or rejects. It's a take-it-or-leave-it offer. This leaves an open question, though. Why doesn't Barbara have the ability to make counteroffers if she doesn't like the offer that Albert is making to her? And in fact, in most contexts, these counteroffers are what goes on in the real world. You can think about this in terms of bargaining over a car, or bargaining at the flea market, or bargaining over a raise with your boss. You have the ability to say, hey, I don't like that offer, how about this instead? And so what we're going to be doing now, starting in this unit, is go through a series of different cases where we have the ability to make these counteroffers. And as always, we start simple. The simplest way of thinking about counteroffers is to allow for a single counteroffer to happen. So the game that we're going to be analyzing in this lecture is as follows. Albert will make an offer. Barbara will accept or reject that offer. And if she rejects, she now makes a counteroffer which then Albert chooses whether to accept or reject. Accepting implements those solutions that are being offered, whereas this final rejection by Albert in the last stage leads to complete bargaining breakdown and both players receiving nothing. Now, the one little wrinkle I have to add into this is the value of time. If we reject in this first stage, that's going to stall things. And the way we're going to model this stalling of the economic relationship is to use what's known as a discount factor. A discount factor is represented by a lowercase delta, commonly in economics and bargaining. So you can see that on your screen there. That value between 0 and 1 is a lowercase delta. And what we're going to be doing with this lowercase delta is multiply it by the payoffs that you receive in the second stage if you have the offer being accepted. So what this is doing for us is it's saying, you know what, getting an offer in the second stage is better than nothing perhaps, but it's less good, it's not as good, it's worse, that's the word for it, in the second stage than it is in the first stage. So for example, if we were to have a proposal which divides the good between us 50-50, if we're enjoying half of the surplus apiece, it's better to enjoy half of the surplus today than it is to enjoy half of the surplus tomorrow, or next year, or next decade, or next century. In other words, time is money, and so if we are stalling, if we are delaying an agreement, this is going to be costly to us. So we're shrinking the value of the good that we're bargaining over, over time. And that's what that discount factor, that lowercase is delta, uh, delta is doing for us. It might help to actually see this in terms of a game tree and where this delta is coming into play. So this is the game that we're analyzing. Albert is making a first offer X between 0 and 1 to Barbara. If Barbara accepts, then that implements that settlement, so she receives a value of X, and Albert receives the remainder. This should look very similar so far to what we've been looking at before in the ultimatum game. The difference now, though, is if Barbara rejects, she's now making a counteroffer. So we venture over to the right side of the game tree, where now Barbara is making the offer Y between 0 and 1, again, just a percentage division of the surplus between the two parties, which Albert chooses whether to accept or reject. Because this is the last stage, if Albert rejects, then both players receive 0. If Albert accepts, ignore those discount factors, those lowercase deltas for a moment. Notice that if Albert accepts, then Albert is receiving Y and Barbara is receiving the remainder. But again, the difference here is that having that division today, having that benefit of economic relationships between us is better to have that now than it is later. So if we have an agreement reached in the second stage, we're multiplying our division of the surplus by delta to shrink it. So instead of getting the full benefit of y, I get a y multiplied by a number between a 0 and a 1. So I'm only getting a fraction, a smaller fraction of the benefit that I would be getting if we agree to the same settlement up front in the first stage. With that, I can now solve the game. So the way we solve these games, as always, is to start at the end and work our way backward. So let's look at the end. Well, if we reach the second stage, this actually looks very similar to the ultimatum game that we were looking at before, with now Barbara making the offer and Albert making the accept or reject decision. So if Albert rejects, he receives a payoff of nothing, which means he's willing to accept any offer Barbara makes him. 
That's because, again, Albert receives nothing if he rejects, so any offer that Barbara makes to Albert is acceptable. So from Albert's, or rather from Barbara's perspective, if Barbara is trying to maximize her revenue here, the way she's going to be doing that is by offering an amount that leaves Albert indifferent to, indifferent between accepting and rejecting, which in this case is to give the entire surplus to herself. So Barbara is going to offer zero to Albert, Albert will accept, and Barbara receives the entire surplus, which, as we see here, is going to be simplified to just delta. So again, Barbara receives all of the benefits of the trade, all of the benefits of the economic relationship, Albert receives just as much as he would without being able to reach a negotiated solution at all, because he has no bargaining power at the end, just like Barbara did not have any bargaining power at the end of an ultimatum game. So if we reach the second stage, Albert receives zero, and Barbara receives delta. So she's receiving all of the economic benefits of negotiation here in the second stage, but she only gets a fraction of it, the delta fraction of it, because time is costly. Well, we can take this payoff from the second stage and plug it into the bottom of the first stage. So we can now look at the game like this. This is much simpler and much easier to navigate. In fact, this looks very similar to an ultimatum game before with one slight difference. Now, instead of Barbara getting zero if she rejects, she's now making a counteroffer and getting some positive value. In fact, she's getting delta. So now we need to figure out what Albert is going to do based on the fact that Barbara can actually reject and get something for herself if she does make that counteroffer. So now if Albert makes an offer X less than Delta, Barbara is earning Delta for countering and only X for accepting. So in that case, countering is better, which means if Albert makes an offer less than Delta, now Barbara has a credible threat to reject that offer, which means now Albert cannot deny Barbara the entire surplus or any surplus at all, because if he tries doing that, Barbara is going to reject that offer. In contrast, if he makes an offer of at least delta, now x is greater than or equal to delta, Barbara is going to accept under those circumstances, because x is now at least as good as rejecting and getting uh, a delta value for countering. So in this case, she's going to accept. Now we need to think about which one is better for Albert. Well, if Albert demands less than delta, again, Barbara is going to counter, and that's going to leave a payoff of zero for Albert, which is very bad for Albert. So it's very clear here that Albert is not going to be making an offer that Barbara is going to reject. In fact, in contrast, if he tries demanding X at least as big as Delta, Barbara is going to accept. This gives Albert a payoff of one minus X, and because Albert's payoff is going to be smaller as Delta is larger, the way he maximizes his payoff here is to offer the amount that Barbara is, the smallest amount that Barbara is willing to accept. And the smallest amount that Barbara is willing to accept is X equal to Delta. So this means that we have a solution here. We can summarize the results as follows. Albert offers Delta in the first stage and Barbara accepts immediately. What this means is that the threat to have a counteroffer doesn't actually mean it needs to be used. In that second stage, what will happen is Barbara will make an offer of everything. She'll demand everything for herself, and Albert will accept all of those offers. And that's going to be bad for Albert, but good for Barbara. Albert then needs to anticipate what's going on in the second stage and react accordingly. And the way he's going to react accordingly is to increase the offer to Barbara in the first stage. And so we see this total surplus of one, that 100% of the economic benefits from the relationship, now actually being split between the parties. It's not the first guy who's making the proposal who's getting everything. They're actually sharing in the surplus. Barbara is receiving delta and Albert is receiving one minus delta. Now notice, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, the exact division depends on the size of delta. If delta is very large, in other words, if it's not that costly, for Barbara to reject an offer, then she will end up very well off and Albert will not be uh, very well off. And the same is true in reverse, where if Albert is looking at a discount factor that's very, very small, then he'll do very well for himself if uh, we have the single counter offer in the game that we analyzed here. So that's the result that we have found with a single counter offer. What we have left over here, though, is a couple of lingering questions. First, you might notice that there are actually two things that were different from the first model, that ultimatum game that we looked at before. So in the ultimatum game, remember, it was just a single offer that Barbara accepted or rejected. Here, there are two different components that are being added on. First, there's a second offer that now Barbara is making. And second, it's the fact that Barbara is the one making that offer. 
So it's unclear, based off of what I've shown you here, whether Barbara is able to extract some of the surplus from Albert simply because there is a second stage of bargaining, or precisely due to the fact that she is the one who's making the counteroffer in the second stage. And that's what we're going to address in the next lecture, and we'll get a very clear answer to which one is causing or which one is allowing Barbara to reap some be uh, benefits from the bargaining relationship here. And the second thing that we'll be considering after this next lecture is why stop at just one counteroffer? Why can't, if Albert doesn't like Barbara's counteroffer, Albert make a counteroffer of his own? And then Barbara, why can't she make a counteroffer after that? Why can't these counteroffers theoretically continue until forever? And that's what we'll be looking at later on, and eventually we'll build up to what's called Rubenstein bargaining, which you might have heard in an economics class before. So that's what is going on with counteroffers. We see that counteroffers are actually very good for you. If you are able to make counteroffers, you are getting more of the surplus for yourself. So counteroffers are good, but we're going to be continuing to analyze what exactly is going on with these counteroffers in the next lecture. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.